All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, first session. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Perfect. So I'm delighted to be here today and present a research project which I've been undertaking uh, with a colleague uh, from Lisbon, Giovanni De Gregorio, who is not here today, but is with us in spirit. Um, so this is a project about the Universal Code of Conduct, and basically I will present today a bit of background on this research, um, the methods we used, data, and findings, okay? And hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers. So uh, a bit of background, uh, you're all uh, familiar with the Universal Code of Conduct, I assume, um, but the goal of our research was is to examine the codification process of the Universal Code of Conduct and its enforcement mainly through interviews, okay? And we also used um, a, a test case with the French Wikipedia to see how the Universal Code of Conduct is received locally, all right? So we have a team of three researchers, uh, Giovanni and I, and a PhD student from Oxford, uh, Roxana Gon, who is helping us. And we're very thankful for the funding of the Wikimedia uh, Research Fund, which has allowed us to do this research. Um, so in terms of outputs, we, are, um, we have written already two interim reports. Uh, we're in the process of uh, writing a final report, and then we will uh, write and publish, uh, hopefully, uh, open source uh, scientific paper, all right? Um, so, uh, also in terms of background, and as a reminder for those of you who are not familiar with the Universal Code of Conduct, but I'll go very quickly because I'm sure you know about it, uh, there were two uh, main phases that we're interested in. Um, phase one, the so-called phase one, which led to the Universal Code of Conduct. Uh, this phase uh, uh, started with uh, policy research and consultations. And then um, a drafting committee, the so-called phase one drafting committee, uh, made of five volunteers and four staff members, worked uh, from July until September 2020, uh, and then obtained feedback and consultations during and after uh, the drafting process. And this led to uh, the adoption of the UCOC by the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees in December 2020. Uh, we're also interested in the second set of rules, uh, the UCOC enforcement guidelines. And again, there were consultations prior to 2021, followed by a drafting phase, by a phase two drafting committee uh, from April 2021 to January 2022. There was a first vote of the community in March 2022, followed by a phase two revision. Um, and then again, a second vote in January 2023, which led to the adoption of the UCOC, UCOC enforcement guideline. So these are the two set of rules we're interested in. And to study these sets of rules and their adoptions, we adopted uh, certain methods. Um, our approach is empirical and inductive, which means we make findings based on empirical data, and I'll say a few words about this data in a minute. And it is also an inductive approach, meaning we don't have a preconceived idea of how it works. We're simply approaching it through um, what our interviewees tell us. And of course, we're careful to have a wide range of interviewees uh, coming from different backgrounds. Uh, so data collection, uh, semi-structured interviews. Um, I could say more about that. Um, and document analysis based on the very rich open archive uh, that uh, offers Wikipedia, particularly on Meta, okay? Now, a few words about this data, uh, focusing on the interviews. We have already uh, carried out uh, uh, interviews with 27 people, uh, eight members of phase one committee, six members of phase two committee, eight members of the so-called revisions committee, seven members of the Wikimedia Foundation, three upcom members, seven members of the French Wikipedia, and another category, others uh, with two uh, people. So if you add up, it doesn't add up because some people fall under various categories. So don't worry, <laughs> it's just some people are members of phase one committee and at the Wikimedia Foundation. Okay, so there's, a, there's double counting in that sense. All right, so let me move on to uh, the most 
interesting part, uh, which are the findings. And these findings at this stage are rather descriptive. Um, they will be more analytical in the scientific paper that will come out at some point. Um, and so I will structure uh, these findings in, in five categories. Uh, the origins, the process, enforcement, local reception, and finally, maybe a more analytical part on what we call the legalization of Wikipedia. Um, so in terms of origins, uh, what we found interesting um, as a starting point is the kind of tension and perhaps even conflict that exists on the Wikimedia space between the idea that um, cooperation should um, happen freely uh, with these libertarian roots that basically a, a kind of social equilibrium arises from uh, open and spontaneous, uh, um, spontaneous uh, collaboration on the one hand, and the idea that uh, these interactions should be uh, done in a civil or courteous manner. And we see this tension or this conflict, uh, for instance, in the five pillars. Uh, between the fourth, for instance, and the fifth pillar, we see the fourth pillar Wikipedia editors should treat each other uh, with respect and civility. That's a kind of normative rule. And on the other hand, the fifth pillar, which is uh, Wikipedia has no uh, firm rules. And that's something we'll come back to, which is, I think, rooted in this libertarian understanding of free cooperation among individuals leading to an optimal social outcome. Um, so we see uh, uh, this tension, uh, but uh, speaking about the origins of the UCOC, uh, we see uh, pressure points uh, in the recent history of the community that have led, according to our interviewees, to the Universal Code of Conduct. And I will differentiate between two types of pressure points, internal pressure points and external pressure points. Internal pressure points, there are two main pressure points, according to our interviewees. One is the Fram case, which I assume you have all heard about. Um, and here is what an interviewee told us. Uh, truly, FRAM is what causes the UCOC. Part of the issue with FRAM was that there was no one who was willing to sanction FRAM. And the reasons why for that are very complex, but essentially by creating a universal code of conduct, then it provides an opportunity for someone other than a community that is unwilling to enforce it against a given member to then step in and enforce it. So first pressure point. Second pressure point, uh, um, which is linked with this, uh, the issues arising from cooperative behavior uh, and uh, free cooperative behavior, the Croatian case. And you, again, I, I assume are aware with this uh, issue where um, a small local Wikipedia project was captured by a community of editors with a certain political agenda. And here again, uh, here is a quote that illustrates that issue. Uh, Wikipedia is something that is so bottom up, such that only local projects have any sovereignty over themselves, which is incredibly disruptive to the movement. And this is a hole into our mission and vision. Look at the Croatian Wikipedia as a great example. Look at the Scots Wikipedia. Look at the Azeri Wikipedia, which is an ongoing problem. So two points of external pressure, but also one point of external pressure. And the external pressure is the kind of legal landscape that is shifting. And I'm thinking of EU regulations here. Um, one interviewee told us they, and I believe they meant uh, the foundation, were more or less obliged in any case to do a code. They had to do one for Europe. So they told themselves, why not do the same for everyone? And then another interviewee, uh, uh, which is uh, perhaps a little more explicit, uh, the legal landscape is changing across the whole world, not just in the US, but in Europe where there is a greater deal of responsibility being expected from companies that host services online like ours, et cetera, et cetera. So we see here that there is a, an external legal landscape that is changing, that is shifting from the US, the original US legal landscape that was extremely permissive to the one imposed by the EU, which is much less permissive. Of course, this raises, and you know that as Wikipedians, uh, enormous controversies uh, on, uh, on, um, on the network. But I would say that these controversies, uh, those who initiated the process were very well aware of those controversies. Here's what uh, uh, the process raised as controversies. Uh, the process is quite a departure from the Wikimedia model of the past. One technique would be start a page on MetaWiki on OpenPage and just let everyone edit. And I will skip. <laughs> 
unfortunately, again, you go back to the first problem. Who is going to dominate the editing there? Who is going to be inclined to edit there? And so we decided to go for a more structured process. So this is a kind of controversial dimension of the project, of course, is its, to a certain extent, top-down dimension. Okay? And the same issue arose for the selection process of those sitting uh, in uh, these uh, committees, these drafting committees. Um, so again, quote, uh, so we decided that we would do the selection ourselves, and that was a controversial step. However, we did put a lot of work into it, recruiting folks who had policy writing experience, who brought a really good wide set of experience. So people who could represent some of these small communities, people who could represent groups that had seen higher levels of harassment than the main communities. But we also, of course, needed to have representatives from a large wikis to make sure there is some harmony in how this policy is written with some of the local policies. So there is a very clear effort to promote a certain level of diversity within these drafting committees. And as a natural outcome of diversity, some debates arose within the drafting committees. And I cannot uh, walk you through all these um, debates and controversies, but one is worth mentioning, and that is the meaning of race. And that was specifically uh, came out during uh, phase one. All right? So, of course, this is not a big surprise, uh, but depending on the system or the country where you are, you might or might not recognize the existence of races. And this is a highly controversial point. Um, here's what an interviewee told us. There was the challenge of identifying values that were universal, like when you talk about race, what does it mean to different people? And even more explicitly, another interviewee said, at another point where we had a lot of discussion uh, was the word race, and I said to myself, I don't want this word in the code of conduct because in no ethical code in a certain country, even in university ethical codes, you don't see the word race in Europe because nobody accepts that there are different races. So these are key philosophical debates, right? And you see um, a compromise. I think uh, it is reflected in a kind of compromise in uh, the language of the UCOC. If you compare Article 2 with Article 3.1 of the UCOC, you will see the presence or not of race in, in either provision. Enforcement, again, the same debate or tension between bottom-up and top-down governance. Um, here is an interesting aspect to underline to see uh, the challenges that were raised during the drafting process. And here I'm thinking more specifically about the enforcement guidelines. Uh, halfway, I'm citing here the quote on the slide. Halfway uh, through the revisions committee, one of the committee members brought up the concept of sub subsidiarity, which is the idea that the smallest, most local body should handle issues and it, unless it is beyond their capability at which point, then it escalates. But if a smaller, more regional, more local body can handle, it should. And you see this reflected in the enforcement guidelines in section one. In line with the movement principle of decentralization, the UCOC should be enforced at the most relevant local level possible. Now, turning to uh, local reception, and this is based on uh, the case of the French Wikipedia, what we saw is that um, existing divides within the French community, the Francophone community, um, basically uh, were dramatized by the Universal Code of Conduct. I mean, the Universal Code of Conduct came into a landscape that was already divided, and different stakeholders in these uh, divides basically take different positions on the uh, Universal Code of Conduct. And that's something that our interviewees told us very consistently. But one said it, I think, uh, very uh, concisely. Um, actually, I just skipped uh, something, I'm sorry, here. Um, on the one hand, there is a group that identifies itself as being inclusive and progressive which the others call woke. And on the other hand, there is another group that presents itself as universalist, rationalist, and that the first group calls reactionary or fascist. The inclusive group is very much in favor of the UCOC, which it considers as a method that will protect them against what they call aggressions. 
The others are much more reluctant because in their own words, it is an Anglo-Saxon fantasy that we do not need. And by we, they mean the Francophone Wikipedians. So we see a lot of controversies, a lot of debates. What is quite interesting is that references to the UCOC are spreading. And we see that whether those citing or referring to the UCOC are in favor or against it, which might be a sign that, in fact, the legitimacy of this UCOC is to a certain extent recognized. We see references in disputes before outcomes. We see uh, references in disputes between editors. And we see references in decisions rendered by administrators and stewards across different projects. OK, so let me turn to uh, the last um, bit of my presentation. And hopefully, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And this concerns what we call the legalization of uh, Wikipedia. Um, so that's quite interesting because there are different sides to this legalization. That's something you know, we're currently uh, thinking about. So I would actually be very happy to hear your, your thoughts on this. But we see that the UCLC is provide a, providing a kind of jurisdictional basis to do things that couldn't be done in the past. Uh, and this is something our interview has told us, and I think this is supported clearly by the text of the UCOC. The UCOC provides the legal basis. Please note the legalistic language, the legal basis, okay? This is not a lawyer saying that. This is just uh, someone involved in this process. The legal basis for somebody else enforcing the things that should have already been enforced. And this interviewee, in all fairness, was referring here to the Fram case. Another interviewee, again, used that kind of jurisdictional legalistic language. What we're trying to do is create a system of justice that will bridge hundreds of languages and communities around the world. Now, it creates a jurisdictional basis to do certain things. It also creates a substantive body of rules that are, we can call them mandatory or possibly constitutional. What are constitutional or mandatory rules for lawyers? These are rules that cannot be derogated from by uh, different stakeholders, whether they're public entities or individuals. So basically, that's what the Universal Code of Conduct is doing. And that's what our interviewees told us. For instance, one said, the UCOC, no, sorry, I'm not there. Yes, the community is violent. I mean, we need laws. In any society, there are laws. One cannot let people decide depending on their daily mood, otherwise it is a machine to crush minorities. But you might object and say, but we already have some sorts of rules on Wikipedia. The main difference is this one, and I think was captured by, our, by another interviewee. A lot of the on Wikipedia policies, and note the word policies and not laws or rules, can be amended by any editor. And some of them wander off the place widely you never have a kind of situation that is stable for a year, so they are unstable and often end up in a very badly worded form. But the code of conduct is unamendable and everybody is bound by it. Okay, So that's one aspect. It is binding. It is not something that can be amended, at least not by any editor on the Wikipedia space. There is something else that is clearly mandatory with the UCOC. It is the fact that it is a baseline that cannot be contradicted. Um, at least um, it can only be um, complemented in a stricter direction. Interviewee two, the idea of the UCOC is that it is so fundamentally obvious that that should be the baseline. That's where we start and then everything else more strict is built up on that. We may have stricter rules within Wikipedia on the English Wikipedia but that's the fundamental basis that should be respected. Even more clearly, interviewee 22 told us, we have one governing guideline or constitution that sort of like guides our action because sometimes some of the things we do in our local communities may not necessarily be acceptable when we come to a global community like Wikipedia. Okay, so these are very descriptive findings and some of you are already very familiar with this. Maybe at a the more theoretical level, um, and I will not insist on this, but maybe this opens some ideas for discussion. And I will please pardon my academic kind of tendency to theorize things that are very practical. 
But we see uh, initially, uh, you may remember, I started with this idea of conflict, this tension between um, the freedom of a space rooted in libertarian values on the one hand, and that's pillar five, and on the other hand, um, the need to have respectful interactions on this uh, space, and that is uh, pillar number four. And I believe these institutional norms which surround you know, the, the Wikipedia space, um, Wikimedia spaces, uh, are conflicting to a certain extent. I mean, you can see how these can enter into conflict. And that's what I call the conflicting institutional norms. These result in conflicting organizational rules at a more practical level. You see tension on a day-to-day -day basis in the rules that are applied on, on, on these spaces. And finally, on the ground, conflicting internal behavior. People who relate to Wikipedia because they like one or the other of the values. And because of that, they fundamentally disagree on what it means to be a Wikipedian. The UCOC, I don't know if you will achieve to do that, but I think what it is trying to do is to tilt the balance between those two values. And it's trying to tilt it in the direction of, of perhaps a more legalized, a more normative uh, space that is you know, careful at uh, preserving some norms of conduct. So there is, would be ideally, but of course, this is only like an ideal type. This is not going to happen because Wikimedia is much more complex than my little graph on the, on the slide but a select institutional norm that would create clearer, more streamlined organizational rules and hopefully stabilize internal behavior, okay? So I have three minutes, 50 minutes, uh, uh, three minutes, 50 seconds. And so I thank you for your attention. Any questions, please uh, feel free to ask and you can write to me. <clears throat> thank you. Ah, here. We need to use the microphones for the folks who have joined us online. Yep, so thank you. Thank you for presentation. I, I know the room, room name was missing, so I was like hard to finding, but yeah, so I, I'm Young Jim from the former Youth Sports Day Building Committee. So we, I, I was part of the building the Youth Sports Day Committee charter after the ratification yeah. processor came in. Yeah. And what I was like saying is like, what I'm expecting is like that we are trying to building the reporting system or the whatever systems are not building on the small wikis that they don't have enforcement systems too much. Because I know that many committee members are from the the bigger, larger wikis. So I, I expecting like the how, I want to see how the U4C committees works and the government, how the reporting and the other things implemented by U4C and everything is working. And then ha have to evaluate more about the how the universal code of charter goes. This is like my simple and quick comment. So thank you very much for presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, it, it all depends in the end on, on another aspect which we are not focusing on, which is the U4C, you know, which will come out at some point. Yeah. So thank you for that comment. Here, I can. Thanks for this talk. Um, I find this very interesting, and uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to reference a, another paper that you wrote, the Canceling Disputes paper, which yeah. came out a year or two ago, which is a great paper. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about how you understand the UCOC and its enforcement comparing to the way that the arbitration committee might be uh, considering things like social capital yeah. and not just the rules. No, that's a great question. Um, I hate being in the business of uh, policy making because that's very dangerous. I leave it to others usually. I think. Deep down, um, the capacity for a dispute settlement body to not uh, give um, priority to a more powerful individual lies in due process rules. I think this is basically probably uh, something that could be considered for the U4C. But again, I hate to you know give advice to I, I'm more someone who observes and, and analyzes. Um, but that's a great, uh, a really good question. I think, I think what the UCOC is trying to do, and we see that when we see uh, the grounding in this internal pressure point to the Fram case, is basically to make sure that situations where a powerful individual is escaping control and sanction doesn't happen again. 
because I think that's typically what happened with Fram. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I realize this is a controversial topic, <laughs> and I want to stay outside of this. Uh, but uh, but um, but uh, so it will be key to ensure that the application of the UCOC is also um, immune to this kind of uh, prioritization of more powerful groups that com can come to the rescue of, of powerful individuals. Yeah. Great question, tough one. <laughs> and maybe. Sorry, we've got a question from um, folks online. Um, how flexible is this? Who can amend it? Who oversees it? How is it decided? And what amendment needs to be done? And what shouldn't? So quite a complicated question. Yeah, from no, the folks it's online. a good question. In two, one, zero second, <laughs> I see the timer. We've uh, got five minutes more uh, for discussion. You've got some. Ah, breaks. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, super. Um, so uh, the, the 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 so I I the the quick answer to this is I don't know. Uh, my sense, I mean, based on what I've heard is that uh, there is no procedure for the amendment of the Universal Code of Conduct. And most constitutions, you know, have a procedure for amendment, which is, you know, usually not used so easily. This one doesn't have one. Uh, it is also not left to the community to, to amend it. So the short answer is uh, there is no possibility for amendment. I'm sure there would be a possibility if there is an issue uh, to, to amend it. That being said, I think uh, what is important to see is that it is a baseline. Uh, some of these values are so obvious that, I mean, to a certain extent, unless there are issues when applying them, you know, I don't, I don't know if there would be really a need to amend them. But I think it's, it's a product of design, the fact that they cannot be amended, because that's one of the issues with a very unstable environment based on very unstable policies and the need to have, at some point, you know, certain fixed guidelines, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic presentation. I'm following your research. Uh, I was curious because you mentioned uh, now some new legislation like Digital Services Act and yeah. Wikipedia is regulated under the Digital Services Act. Yeah. And uh, putting the, the conduct, code of conduct in the framework of uh, platform governance or digital constitutionalism, to what extent do you think, or if you are following this conversation, this model is replicable? Because this is a very different, the, the platform that Wikipedia is, is very different yeah, than yeah. everything that is regulated under this act. So I was curious to what extent we can hope that this could be replicated as a model. When you say spaces. replicated as a model, you mean, are you questioning the fact that this model would apply to Wikipedia? Or are you saying what Wikipedia has done could be replicated yes. elsewhere? It could be replicated yeah. elsewhere. I, I, my sense, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, on a digital constitutionalism. Giovanni is, but he's not here. <laughs> um, is that uh, I think this kind of model is spreading. I mean, whether it is... Um, the right reaction from the foundation to, to apply to Wikipedia. I mean, that's a whole different conversation. But uh, my sense is that there is a level, what sociologists call isomorphism. That's a complex word for say that there's a diffusion of models of governance across different spaces for different reasons. Uh, for mimetic reasons, they're simply imitating, copying each other, thinking that what works on one space will work on the other space. For professional reasons, those who create a system in one, one platform will just diffuse it on another one, and, uh, and for, for legal reasons also. And I think in the case of Wikipedia, that's one of the tensions, the legal landscape that is changing. And that's my final word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will stay for the next presentation. So. Awesome. So if anyone needs to 